All right, welcome back. We do apologize uh, for that technology wasn't uh, on our side uh, there. But of course, uh, Ntabiseng Dubazana, Director of uh, Dubazana Attorneys, uh, joins us now uh, for some commentary, of course, uh, as of course the Senza Muiwa trial uh, does indeed continue. State witness Zandir Kumalo denying um, an altercation between herself and her then boyfriend, Longwa Twala, uh, which then resulted in soccer star Senza Muiwa being shot dead in 2014. So I'll start uh, with that first question again, uh, Ntabiseng. And once again, thanks for being with us. Denials of of course, uh, could be quite costly uh, for, for those on the stands. Zandira Kumalo, of course, denying that there was any sort of altercation between herself and her then boyfriend, Longo Twala. Um, where do you see this line of questioning uh, going or what it could you know, possibly lead to? So I believe that the defense attorneys are trying to basically exonerate their clients for, from being there at the scene on the day in question. So what they're trying to establish is saying that on the day in question, yes, my client wasn't there, but over and above my client not being present at the scene, a whole different um, incident happened on the day in question, apart from what you're saying. But then when you listen to how um, the judge uh, interrupted this mm -hmm. line of questioning when he came to the third... Um, um, defense counsel, or the counsel number four, I don't, I don't quite recall. Yeah. He then asked, um, I haven't heard any of the defense counsel saying that they're denying that there were perpetrators that came into the house on the day in question. And then when he clarified his reasoning behind that is that if you're saying your, your instructions from your client are that I was never there on yeah. the day in question, then what's the point of us going through the details of what could have happened, what could not have happened, was this three shots, was it no three shots, inclusive of this kind of um, uh, line of questioning which says that instead of two perpetrators shooting Senzo, it was actually actually a, a gunshot from Longwe's gun or whatever the case may be when there was an, an altercation. But, but this line of questioning could not then lead uh, to, you know, shedding some light as to uh, then, then what happened. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to ascertain why uh, there would be this heavy objection on it. I mean, if, 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 the, if the gentlemen who are, uh, you know, being accused were not there and you're painting a story of what actually could have then happened instead, don't the two at some point uh, link well, not necessarily. Remember, this case is not about what happened in, in the absence of the accused. Yeah. It's about oh. what happened if the accused were the ones who did it. Yeah. So if, the, if my instructions from my client are saying, I wasn't there, therefore I would not know what would have happened. Okay. The purpose of, for, for example, um, one of the attorneys um, went through statements and then um, the, the witness, Ms. Andy, kept saying that she doesn't recall whether she signed or she, it was read back to her, etc. So now as a result, he's calling um, the police officer who wrote down the statement that's now going to turn to a trial within a trial. And if after all of that is done, and then the statement that he's going to use does not link up with whatever defense um, that his client has given him, mm -hmm. it would have been a, a, a whole thing in futility. Um, so the basis of this uh, kind of trial, the way in which the judge is trying to push this trial to go to, is to say whether or not the identification of the accused persons in the dock is the same identification that will be given by the witnesses of who did what uh, it is alleged happened on the day in question. All right, I have two questions, and I hope I'm not overloading you here. Uh, but certainly the best way to prove that, you know, your client, the accused, uh, wasn't there is to prove some sort of an alibi, and one would then, you know, wonder, is there, is there not at this point some, you know, plausible or probable or, um, you know, stable alibi for uh, the accused uh, on the stand? That's my first question. The second question then is about that the issue of the second docket, does that then not come into play? I mean, if you're not, uh, if, you, if, the, if the accused were not there and you want to paint a story of what could have actually happened, uh, then I suppose uh, the, the, the issue of the second doc, uh, docket would then come into play. When exactly would this come forward? Because in the first trial, uh, I remember that, that, that docket, uh, the, the issue of the docket came in uh, uh, quite late. One would think that now it would be brought up, uh, you know, sooner. Yeah. So with regard to the alibi question, once your client is not put on the scene by the witnesses there, you really don't have a reason to delve into the issue of alibi. Yeah. Because right now, um, from the, from the uh, cross-examination that has happened, there has been an excuse that, well, the persons, when they walked in, they wore masks and it was during COVID, which is already a problem. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a situation where, no, I don't want to point out somebody because I'm only suspecting somebody so I don't I can't really say yeah. that these people that are sitting 
before the judge here are the ones that committed the crime. So as a result, your client is not placed at the scene at all. If your client was placed at the scene, then you would require an alibi saying that even though you're saying you saw Ntabi Singh there on the day in question, I have evidence here to the contrary to say that on the day in question she was in X place doing one, two, three, four, and here's the proof thereof. And then they would have to explain why is it that they're connecting Ntabi Singh to the scene, whereas there's proof that at the time that incident happened, Ntabi Singh was never there. Yeah. So that would be the issue when it comes to alibi. And then when it comes to the issue of the second docket, the state has kind of done a U-turn in terms of how they're dealing with um, the state evidence. Remember in the first case, the second docket never made an appearance until in the middle of the state's case, I right. think when it came to the second or third witness somewhere there, when it was brought up by Advocate Devo. And that showed that the state had not done any full disclosure to the defense attorneys. If you recall, Mim Shololo got up and said, but I don't have this, this evidence. Why do I not have it? And it brought around more um, interlocutory applications within the court trial. So what happened this time is that the pretrial court conference that happened dealt with a lot of that. So a lot of admissions were made in terms of 220, um, Section 220 of the Criminal Procedure Act. And as a result, it cut out a lot of things. If you remember, in the first trial, there were issues about there were beer kings here and there, but then when we came back, they were removed. So those things we're not going to deal with anymore in this situation. They were dealt with in the admissions. So now what we're dealing with is only the, the accused, whether or not they were present, and whether or not they committed the actual crime. And what the state has done is that take the they took the suspects in the second docket and have turned them into state witnesses. So that's how they're dealing with the second docket. Yeah, I'm obviously jumping the gun a little bit here, but, you know, if it does happen that uh, the accused, you know, it turns out that they indeed were actually not uh, there at the scene, what then happens uh, to uh, the circumstances around what happened? I mean, you're saying that the issue is, is not right now uh, about uh, what happened in the absence of uh, the accused, but should it turn out that the accused were in indeed absent now we have to deal with the issue of what then uh, transpired and then you know what happens in that case so the second docket if we recall the the dpp had said that they are waiting for this case to end before they make a decision about whether or not to prosecute on the second docket so in the event that the accused persons in this matter are found not guilty mm. then they still have leeway to charge the accused persons in the second docket. So it would not be a situation of um, what we term in English a double jeopardy situation because they would have been used as state witnesses in this case, so they would not have been charged. So when it comes to the second docket being reopened in, the, in that manner, then they would be the accused in that matter. So I think they're looking to see the connection between what happened and the evidence that's going to be brought back to see if the accused persons that are named in the second docket have some kind of causal link to the exact um, occurrences on the day in question. Yeah, but they, they, they can't really necessarily be put to the stand on that about what role they could have played right now, correct? No, very, very much so. So the evidence that they, they are giving right now, it's like obviously in a, in a commission of inquiry, that evidence can't be used against them because it was, it was in, in, um, what can I say, in the confines of trying to solve the case, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And then um, that evidence that is being used today, for example, in this current case, it can't now the SAPA say, okay, you said on this day, on, in this matter, and therefore we will use it against you in this, in this docket. It can't be that way. What they can do is take the evidence that's been used today in this matter, go do further investigations, with that, which I believe are still outstanding. That's why that docket was never pursued in any manner. And if any evidence comes out as a result of the, of the investigation, then they can use that to charge the accused person. Yeah, and, 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 and let's say this trial, you know, then wraps up um, and uh, the accused are, you know, set free. Um, and we then have to deal with ultimately the issue of the second docket and we have new accused. Mm. Yeah, let's say those new accused, those who are uh, witnesses on the stand uh, uh, now, um, have contradicted themselves and now they have to say something different in uh, the next trial. Can that be used against them? What they said initially in this trial, uh, could that uh, be used? And of course, as again, I'm, I'm jumping the gun again. <laughs> well, 
Well, no. I mean, they can object to all of that. They yeah. can bring up um, the, the confines of that, or, or what I just explained. That yeah. that can't be used against them. What what I'm foreseeing could possibly be um, the the ultimate um, situation or predicament, depending how you look at it, yeah. would be that some of the witnesses in the second docket, should it be pursued, they would actually become 204 witnesses, mm-hmm. which is going to be very interesting to see how that would work out. So I think we will have to wait and see how that works out. All right. Always a pleasure hearing your analysis. And Tabi Singh Dubazana, uh, Director of uh, Dubazana Attorneys, uh, they're reflecting, of course, on the Senzo Meyua trial, uh, which, of course, uh, is uh, preceded. And, of course, we're on the second trial at this point with State Witness uh, Zandile Kumalo being on the stand.